Good morning and welcome to a Friday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. My name is Rich Brown, the co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, which happens to be America's leading self-defense podcast. And uh, today I'm joined by my good friend, the esteemed Will Wood. Good morning, Will. Hey, good morning, brother. How are you? You know the deal, pal. I'm better than I deserve. Aren't we all? <laughs> I got the notification we're live, so here in just a second, people will start jumping on. At least I hope they will. But in the meantime, man, let's talk about some sponsors. <clears throat> yeah. We are very blessed to have some amazing sponsors here at Coffee with the Rich and the American Warrior Show. Sponsors like Mountain Man Medical, makers of the co-branded trauma kit. And if you go to Mountain Man Medical, you can watch all the videos where Brian McLaughlin, former Navy corpsman, who's fought with the Marines in Afghanistan will actually walk you through step-by-step step how to use the components in our co-branded trauma kit. So please check out Mountain Man Medical. These are not Chinese knockoffs. These are brand name, high quality products sold at a rock bottom price to those that watch Coffee with Rich. We also have Precision Holsters. Precision Holsters, makers of the Ultra Appendix Holster that I carry my G26 in. They also have an amazing competition line of holsters. They have belts. They have everything you need. Mag pouches. Please check out Precision Holsters. Uh, I just cannot say better things about them. They also have the Mike Seeklander line of holsters. If you're into that kind of thing, please check them out. Cool Fire Trainer. Why dry fire will when you can cool fire? You know what I'm saying? And that is exactly what I do. I've got one for my, uh, my Glock 17, and that is what I do because I'm cool. Yes, you are. <laughs> Yeah, there's no mistaking about it. <laughs> I'm a legend in my own mind, brother. <laughs> no, you're, you're a legend in everybody's mind. Oh, bro. yeah, right, right. So the cool if fire I want to trainer. talk to my kids about that, they have different opinions. Uh, yeah, well, don't do that. Don't, do, don't talk to the kids. So uh, cool fire trainer, man, like I said, why dry fire when you can cool fire? Dry firing is so 1990s. Mm -hmm. Cool fire is where it's at. It's your gun. You replace the barrel and the recoil spring, and you get felt recoil. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, felt recoil. If you haven't tried it before, you really need to because it will take your dry fire game to the next level. You know why? Because it's not like I love the cert, right? I mean, I, I mm -hmm. have several of them. I absolutely love the cert training device. However, this is your gun. It's your trigger, your sights. Mm -hmm. It's it's your gun, your grip panel. It's going to feel just right in your hand and give you the felt recoil you need to get some good training reps in. And hey, I uh, I found a new use for it uh, a couple weeks back, maybe a month ago now. Had a brand new shooter. Said, "Hey, Will, can you take me out, and teach me how to shoot?" I said, "Sure, but first you're gonna come over to the house. We're gonna do a bunch of bunch of dry fire, literal dry fire first, just to get them familiar with it. And then I threw the cool fire in, so we got a little bit of recoil, just to get an idea. Oh, this is why you grip the gun. Yeah. And then we went out shooting. And I love it, that. I, it really made it, it. It was a great transition. So yet another way to use that tool. Let's welcome some folks onto the show, Will. Looks like we got yeah. Alan Kelly on. From previously Occupy Virginia. That's right. Tony is on from Brunswick, Georgia, and we got uh, Will Rhodes. Awesome. Welcome, guys. Please. Yeah, welcome, guys. Please like it, hit that share button. Got 11 folks ju jumping on so far. Let's talk about APPHemp.com, which is Jesse Ross and his beautiful family growing the finest CBD products money can buy in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. If you haven't been there, Asheville is an absolutely beautiful little hippie colony in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Absolutely beautiful place. Some of the best craft beer, some of the, probably the best craft beer scene, I would say east of the Mississippi. What do you think? Have you been there, Will? I have not. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm digging this craft beer scene though. I may have to check that out. Maybe I can uh, swing down by there and pick you up and uh, we can run over there and have us a couple of uh, cold ones. Brother, count me in. Uh, All right. I've, I've got some good friends that live there. Besides Jesse, some other outstanding former Marines that live there. We can have a good time. It'd be awesome. But yeah, so APPHemp.com, Appalachian Standard, CBD tinctures that you can put underneath your tongue. If you're into that kind of thing, it'll help you sleep better. It'll help your cognitive function better. It's good stuff. CBD salves, I highly recommend them. Uh, flour, if you like to smoke the hemp flour at uh, the cabinoids, do some really amazing things for you. Please check them out for more on what CBD can do for you. Century Martial Arts makers of the Bob XL. Bob XL, the Body Opponent Bag XL, is an amazing striking tool. Do you have one, Will? I do, and uh, I use it a couple different ways. I know you talk, uh, talked with Mike about using it as a, a cardio workout versus getting on a 
treadmill and doing the hamster routine. Uh, I just used it yesterday uh, in between sets of deadlifts. And, but I just did it real slow just to work on, on punching technique, make sure my weight was shifting properly, you know, for hooks. And so I used it as a rest period, but also um, almost like a dry fire uh, session in between the sets of the deadlifts. Yeah, that's an outstanding use for Bob. <clears throat> you can use, you can do so many things with Bob. Three-dimensional shooting target. He's down for that. Uh, you want to put a gi top on Bob, put, do a mm -hmm. little ground and pound MMA style. Bob doesn't mind at all, man. You want to do what, what Will does. You've got him next to your deadlift stand or you're doing chin-ups and then you jump down mm -hmm. and wear Bob out. And, I mean, it's, it's an amazing tool. Check those out. But, uh, so that takes care of our sponsors, Will. All right. Well, let's you, get uh, let's get into the next part of this here. Well, so, uh, let's remind everybody who yeah. we are first. Will tell them about yourself. Oh, I'm I'm your friendly neighborhood airline pilot, uh, also news and economics guy. Uh, been uh, American Warrior Society member for oh gosh, I think going back to maybe podcast thirty five or forty mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Uh, learned about you guys through a friend, and been following you guys ever since. And just a, a big fan of what's happening here, and and proud to be part of it. Well, we're proud to have you, man. And I, of course, I'm Rich Brown, retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer. And my brother, Jeff Brown, is here. Uh, my studio actually is part of my guest house. So Jeff and his uh, beautiful girlfriend, Sarah, are over. I'll be spending the day with him. We've, got a, we've renovated our barn here on the farm well, so we're awesome. having a... Yeah, man, we're having like a, a band play, uh, oh, sweet. some honky tonk music tomorrow night. We got a hot dog vendor coming. It's going to be a hoedown on the floor. All right. 90s country coming back, right? That's right. <laughs> Mary is on my lovely bride. Miss Lisa is on. My good friend Jesse Perez is on. He's coin number 2221. Bob is on. He says, I have used cool, a cool fire for that exact purpose, helping non-gun people ease into firearms ownership. I love that. Yeah, I think I think that's a great use for that that cool fire. John Shriver is on. Linda says good morning from Fort Worth, Texas. Our good friend Will Parker is on. Coin number eight hundred from a snowy Montana. Yeah, and I see uh, with you mentioned John's on. John, I'm going to catch up with you here. We talked about uh, possibly meeting up when I'm down in Oklahoma City in a few weeks for work. So I'll be reaching out to you soon. Outstanding. So please like and hit that share button. Will tell us about today's show. We're going to uh, cover from where you, you left off right after World War II, and we're going to take it up to 1971. So uh, this was this is relatively speaking compared to what you went through, a relatively quiet time until the end. It was one of those things that happened slowly and then all at once. Yeah, well, and, you know, I think there's, with Bretton Woods, a lot of people probably don't know about it. So I think you're probably going to start there, right? Yes. At yep, the end sure of World War II and take us through that. So yep. take it away, my friend. All righty, here we go. So um, uh, as you mentioned, Bretton Woods, uh, Bretton Woods, uh, New Hampshire, uh, they met from July 1 to July 22, 1944 to figure out how the world was going to handle its finances in a post-World War II world. Um, and that was actually prior to the end of World War II, but by then the tide had turned. Normandy had happened. Uh, you know, the, the Allied forces were marching across Europe, and and the um, the it, it was it was cooked in the books at that point. We knew which way it was going to go, so they were trying to get out in front of the curve. Um, and so there were forty four countries represented at, at Bread and Woods, um, New Hampshire, for this meeting, and. The way I think of this is in the past, the to, to the victor go the spoils, right, Rich? No, yeah. And in the past, that was landmass, slaves, you know, if you want to go back to biblical or, or Middle Ages type times. Well, the world's moved on from that, thankfully. Uh, so now it's who controls things because it's it controls where the, the power and eventually the fortune is, right? So, yeah, <clears throat> but, but it's... it's who controls the access to resources mm -hmm. and some of that is just pure geographic luck. I mean, sure. on, on if you're standing on oil or you're not, mm -hmm. but if you control currency, yep. Wow. That would yeah. be something. It, it is. And, and, and we have benefited from that greatly, my friend. Um, and uh, that uh, the first show we did where there was that uh, cartoon YouTube video and it, it, there was a quote, um, and it's from one of the Rothschilds. Says, "If you let me control a currency, I care not who makes the laws." 
that's chilling when you think about it. Mm-hmm. That one of the Rothschilds said that, and make, and this is not you know conspiracy. The Rothschilds mm-hmm. are out there nefariously controlling the the world. But think about that. What he just said. Say that one more time, Will. Sure. If, you will. if if I control the currency, I care not who controls the laws. Yeah, that's creepy. That's the that's the the tail wagging the dog right there. Yeah. So, um, so. Their their goal at Bretton Woods was to make the transition to peacetime as seamless as possible, as efficient as possible. They knew to get, they had to get the world back to some level of stability. Otherwise, we, we could easily just devolve right into another world war. So they came up with a bra- basic uh, framework for this. And it, the center of it is the U.S. dollar. And um, the U.S. dollar was convertible to gold. Uh, it was the only currency convertible to gold, and it was at a fixed thirty-five dollars an ounce. Which you'll remember from your talk, of course, that was when it went from twenty to thirty-five under FDR, and they they kept it there. They kept it at thirty-five dollars an ounce. Twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents. Let's not forget that sixty-seven You're right. cents. Yeah. Back then, Which sixty-seven strange, cents was a big deal. Yeah. Um, now we now if we see that on at, at our ages, Rich, if we see sixty-seven cents on the ground, we think, okay, is that worth the risk of the chiropractor bill to pick that up? Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so now the old, the, the only people that can convert their U S dollars for gold though, were central banks. So other citizens of the world couldn't, you know, uh, throw it in an envelope and, and send it to the federal reserve bank and get some gold. Uh, it was only central banks. So it was a way for those in power to, um, work with one another without the, the citizens getting in the way of that, uh, that structure. Um, yeah, and let, let, this might be a good little moment to pause and remind everybody, and I know we do this on all the emerging threat shows that Will and I have been doing, but remember, there are you have micro threats to you and your family. You go to the Walmart watering hole today, and you have to deal with some mm-hmm. psycho. You you go wherever you leave when you leave the safety of your home and your property, and you're confronted with the other social animals. But mm-hmm. these are the macro problems that can wreak havoc with you just as bad as the micro problems, right, Will? Absolutely. And these are the ones that, you know, sneak up on people. Um, also, what, what, what happened here? You know, and if they're not, if they're not ready for that, then um, it, it, it's like the self-defense scenario. Oh, he came out of nowhere. No, he didn't. He didn't come out of nowhere. Same way these problems that we're seeing in the world didn't just come out of nowhere. Yeah, that's exactly right. So Mark is on from St. Louis. David is on from Adrian, Michigan. Uh, and Alan Kelly says, that sounds great. A honky tonk down home. Tony says he wants a cool fire trainer for the new Wilson combat tactical flintlock. Yeah, man. I'm sure uh, for the right price, one could be had. Yeah. Okay, sir. So uh, convertible to gold at $35 an ounce. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, so only the central banks can convert it. And here's the key, which is still the case today. Um, all international payments are settled in the U S dollar. So they have to convert their currency to the U S dollar, give that to the seller of whatever the product is. And then if they choose to, they can, they convert those U S dollars back into their own currency. And that is still the way it is today. Um, yeah. That, that's uh that's crazy. Well, and that's, you know, if you control the currency, you control the control the control the people, right? So this has benefited the United States handsomely since 1944. Well, as did as we saw in the the last show that I did, how the uh, World War One we benefited greatly financially because we're lending money to Germany to pay off the mm-hmm. Allies, and the Allies are turning around and giving that money right back to us. Yep. And and then here we are after World War Two, we have Bretton Woods, and we're back on top again. Yep. And that's. You know, and like I said, the United States has benefited greatly for this. And not just this, but this was a this was a big player in it. Um, so it's uh, unfortunately, as we're going to get into, this is slowly unraveling over the decades. Um, mm-hmm. And the also the currency rates between all currency, the exchange rates, I should say, between all currencies were fixed. They came up with a fixed number, so there was never any question um, about how many Canadian dollars it took to get a U.S. dollar. Uh, or any other currency from those 44 countries. But is that held true today? That is not. Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit later on. That uh, that fell apart later on, and now the system we have today is uh, it, it floats as a uh, uh, trading mechanism. Okay. 
So this is also where we got the phrase good as gold from because the U.S. dollar being backed by gold, uh, it was as good as gold. If you held the U.S. dollars, you held gold. Uh -huh. um, and of course, obviously, we know that is no longer the case and we'll get into that. Um, uh, at that same time, the foreign central banks, they could hold U.S. dollars, they could hold gold, they could hold whatever they wanted. Almost all of them held U.S. dollars, though. It did a couple things for them. Uh, first, it was good as gold. So why hold it in gold, convert it to dollars, do international trade, convert it back to gold? It, there's a lot of expense and time involved there. So just hold the U.S. dollar. And then when businesses in that country needed to... Um, uh, conduct international trade, they had U.S. dollars on hand. So, now, are those physical dollars in a vault somewhere, Will, or was it digital dollars even back in the 40s I, and 50s? I, I, I'm, I don't know for sure. Uh, I'm guessing it was physical dollars, though, hmm. because that led into um, something we're going to talk about here shortly as, as we get into the 1950s, uh, where there was actually a shortage of, of physical dollars out hmm. there, um, in, more on the international side than the U.S. side. Okay. Um, There's a couple of big institutions that came out of the Bretton Woods um, conference that we still have today, or if you want to look at it uh, the way I do, you still deal with them today uh, in indirectly, and that's the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, IMF is the International Monetary Fund. Their uh, function is to lend money to countries that have large deficits, uh, which as I was writing that in the show notes, I thought, what country doesn't have large deficits anymore? Mm -hmm. um, but that's just a sign of the times, I'm afraid. Uh, the World Bank uh, was there to lend uh, monies to developing countries for infrastructure, and they still uh, do that today. Uh, as usual, though, um, there's controversy around these these institutions. Um, they're no, both, well, what kind of controversy? Know, I'm a conspiracy theory guy. I you know. Uh, yep, that's it. Um, uh, the lizard people are coming, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> um, so both of these institutions are, are headquartered in Washington, D.C. Okay. and are essentially controlled by the United States. Yeah, they, they, they have votes and there's times it goes against us a little bit. But I'm guessing it's pretty much like WWE back there. They they know where their bread gets buttered and they they pretty much do our bidding. So mm -hmm. um, yet again, so we're we're controlling the currency. And we're controlling where it flows to. So I'm Ben. There's a lot of um, uh, influence used there over the the decades to get what the United States wants. Or yet again, it's it's another victory from World War II, if you will. But you know what's creepy? What, what's creepy about that to me? Obviously, there's a lot creepy about that to me. But if you consider like how the uh, the Federal Reserve and IMF and all those, they seem to be just a good old boys club for former executives from Goldman Sachs. You know, and I just learned something not too long ago, and I, I'll try to track down the source for this. And I, so the details are a little fuzzy as I, I listen to a lot of stuff. Um, I want to say the number is $50 million. And that is that if a person goes from the private sector to serving at a certain level or above in the, the, the federal government or, or the Federal Reserve, $50 million is, is tax-free income. So I, that's why you see the revolving door between these huge Wall Street banks and the Federal Reserve and these high level positions like Secretary of the Treasury. Um, it's a big tax break for them. Really? I did not know that. Yeah, I'll, tr I'll track down the source for that because I was always wondering, I mean, you get some guy like Hank Paulson goes from making millions and millions of dollars a year to being Secretary of Treasury for a piddly, you know, $200,000 a year. It's like, why? I guess he's just really civic minded is what I always thought. Well, now there's, there's a reason it's mine. There's always a reason. Isn't there though? Isn't there though? And if you always want to know the, the reason for those types of people, uh, follow the money. That's right. Jared yeah. is on. Good morning, Jared, man. Hope your uh, hope your health is doing better, sir. Good to see you on. He is coin number eight ninety five. And if you want to know what a coin number is, please check out American Warrior society to find out if becoming a member of our community is the right thing for you. Uh, oh, look at that. Ooh, there we go. Yep. Nice. All the cool kids have one. Yeah. You're going to be a coin member, folks. You're going to have to check out American Warrior Society. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, take it away. So are we in the okay. 50s yet? We're in the 50s now. Okay. Uh, we can feel the cool cars with the big fins and the hair. Yep. We can feel it. We're in the 50s now. So so at this point, the dollar is still pretty darn strong. Um, oh, yeah. And 
you know, we've benefited uh, yet again from World War II in that our infrastructure was untouched uh, here within the U.S. So we're, we're churning out goods like crazy. At that time, we had the largest working age population in the world. Wow. So uh, to, you know, the work always flows to the cheapest labor. And we, while we may not have been the cheapest labor, because, but because Europe was still re- doing a lot of rebuilding, <clears throat> they didn't have the ability to churn out goods like we did. So yet another benefit for us from World War II. Well, you know, and it's like we said before, a lot of this is just happenstance of geography, mm-hmm. right? That we have yep. these giant oceans, you know, it's like we don't have a, a tiny little moat around our country or a wall. Yep. We have oceans that yep. kept us safe and our factories intact. So like you said, Europe's yep. in tatters, man, their factories are blown to bits. And guess what? America, we got the greatest amount of workforce and we have factories ready to churn out goods. So, yep. And a great book I read uh, that ends up in that area and then also went forward in the demographics was The Accidental Superpower. Uh, I believe mm. George Friedman wrote that one. Um, and it gets into, uh, you know, how the, the, the way the Mississippi flows and allows us to move grain from the Midwest down to New Orleans and out to sea. Um, great book on that, Accidental Superpower. Um on, uh, when I first saw the title, I thought it was a knock on the United States. It's not. It's just uh, the way geography has worked in our favor. And he wrote the one that you and I read, the the, calm, the, the storm before the calm, right? Yes, sir. Yep, sure and, did. And we're in that storm right now, according we to We are. And I, and I hate to say it, but we're still at the beginning of that storm. Yeah, we are. Um, uh, so we're in the 50s. Um, so the dollar is still strong at this point. Um and but the dollar is so strong it's actually causing a problem because nobody wants to give them up. Nobody mm. wants to give up their dollars because it's as good as gold. And there's a lot of theories out there that it was actually the dollar was actually had more purchasing power than a dollar uh, because it was so so strong at that time. Uh, so this great. Uh, ended up being a uh, shortage of physical dollars uh, known as the dollar gap. Um, and it's actually started stifling international trade because nobody wanted to give up their dollars for the goods. So That's weird, man. Never it heard is. That. It's it's so backwards from what it is now. It's hard to even imagine imagine this, right? Um, so, uh, and this is one of the few times where I'd say they probably did the right thing by uh, printing up some dollars to get some international trade flowing because we're still as a world we're still recovering from World War II and we want that trade to happen, right? That's right. Um, so, um, and of course, like every other time they've printed dollars, what they do, they overcooked it. They did too much of it. Um, I know you're shocked that that's your shock to look. I know. Totally shocked. Yeah. Um, so I got some numbers here on the purchasing power of the dollar over the years. So using the $1945 as your, as the baseline, $1 is $1 purchasing power right after the Bretton Woods agreement by 1950, it took a dollar 33 to purchase a dollar's worth of goods uh, from 1945. By 1955, it's up to a dollar and a half. Uh, 1960, it's a dollar 65. And 1965, it's a dollar 75. So the dollar has decreased greatly in 20 years because they they overcooked it and went, hey, this is kind of fun. We can just print up our own money and do whatever we want. We can also look what happened during that same period of time with size of government, the reach of government, which now we think it would be very little compared to what we have out there now. You know what I find f- weird and that is that uh there are s- so many other countries that use our dollar as mm-hmm. their currency. Isn't that yeah. strange? It is. Um you know but I mean if I put myself in their shoes why why reinvent the wheel, right? You you you, you offload all the responsibilities of printing of managing of uh figuring out international policies all that stuff you offload all that and go hey we'll just use the u.s dollar yeah and just just to read some so obviously puerto rico ecuador mm-hmm. el salvador zimbabwe guam uh, virgin islands uh let's see east timor american samoa marianas islands micronesia palo uh, panama etc cetera, etc cetera. and these are countries that you fly in with dollars in your pockets and you just start mm-hmm. using them. And it seems like there should only be enough dollars sloshing around in our country to take care of us. But yet there are millions and millions of additional people out there mm-hmm. 
that every morning rise and shine to the tune of the U.S. dollar? Well, first off, in the case of Zimbabwe, it's probably a good call for them to use something other than their own management for this. Um, just saying. Um, and, you know, the other one, too, is I wonder how much – a few of those are U.S. territories, so those make sense. Uh, yeah. However, uh, I wonder how much influence that gives us in some of these countries um, – because they're using U.S. dollars, it, I, I don't have. You mean we them. would we would use this to strong arm people? Well, oh, I mean, I'm just making stuff up. Okay, I'm just, I'm the tin full hat on again. Yep, yeah, I got it right over here. I can put it on if you want, but I'd, I'd ruin my '50s hair here. <laughs> yeah, we don't want that. So, um, so uh, at some point, though, you know, it, it gets to the point they start printing enough dollars for all this. People aren't stupid. They start looking around and going, hmm, there's, there's a lot of money flowing around. It's costing me a whole lot more to buy my groceries and gas. Um, so they start looking at this. And it isn't long before people figure out that the silver inside of dimes, quarters, and half dollars, the silver in there is worth more than the face value of the coin. And so they start hoarding them. Uh, this really starts in about 59. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, not too long ago, my wife's grandmother passed away five, six years ago. And one of the things that had to be disposed of in her estate was a safe. I mean, it was, I can't even get my arms that far apart on the video. I mean, it was, it was wider than me and just as tall and it was full of junk silver. Um, mm. and junk silver for anyone that might not know is silver coins, uh, that were in circulation and they're referred to as junk because there's no collectible value. Um, and, but any uh, junk her, silver that you don't want, I'll come and collect it. Yeah. For yeah. It's, junk, it's junk. Rich and I will take it. It's junk. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do um, you a favor. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take it off your hands. Um, we'll, we'll give you a quarter for a quarter. How's that sound? Um, and so he owned a grocery store in small town, Wisconsin for years and years and years. And he would go through the cash registers every night and sort out the silver coins starting in the mid fifties. Cause he, he was a smart man. He saw the writing on the wall. So, um, and those, so we, we got rid of those at the time and, um, uh, d disposed of those. And, uh, a few of those are, are sitting in, in my safe now. So little family well, heirloom. Well, let's talk about that. So 1964 and prior when these, uh, these quarters, uh, mm -hmm. quarter looks just like it, you know, for those mm -hmm. that don't, aren't like Will and I, and you're into this kind of thing. You, a 1964 quarter could easily slip in and out of your hand and go into a, a jukebox or whatever you're, you're doing. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that quarter is worth, help me out here, Will, probably. Uh, I think it's a dollar 25. If memory serves a dollar 25 in face value is an ounce of silver. Mm -hmm. So a fifth, it'd be about $5. Yeah. So there you go. That one quarter is like five bucks. You're mm -hmm. welcome. And, and you know, it was funny when, when I was a kid in the seventies, there were still a fair number of silver coins floating around. You could always tell if you got one because it wouldn't work in the Coke machine because it was really? too heavy. It would fall straight through. Remember that? I don't know. Yeah. It would, it would fall straight through to the, to the coin return and you'd have to, and I remember my dad saying, I'll walk over and get a, get a new quarter. It'll work. And then you walk over to somebody's cash register and trade it in for a new quarter. So you could get your soda. Now, Will, uh, look, now help me out here. That's because silver has gotten so much better, right? I mean, the 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 element silver is oh, just so much yeah. better now. That's yeah, why it's they, worth more, right? They've purified it. Purified or is it, it. Or is it because your dollar has lost tremendous amounts of value? It has lost insane amounts of value. Oh, As you have mentioned, Ray Dalio says cash is trash. Cash and is trash. And as we look back through history, it's really been trash since 1917. Hmm. That hurt. Yeah. Yeah. That'll so, leave a mark. So they realize that people are hoarding silver wheel. This kind of mm -hmm. starts in 1959. And what is, what is the American response to that? Well, of course they, they, they can't let this happen um, because it's, it's going to influence things and, and it, people will f eventually really figure out that the dollar bill isn't worth much anymore either. Not just the silver and the coins. So we get the coinage act of 1965. And it's not the first coinage, coinage act. You'd brought one up before. What year was that one? I failed. Se to 1792, I believe, was the hmm. first one that I'm aware of. So history rhymes then, does it? Yes, it does. So, so the coinage act of 1965 uh, eliminated the silver from dimes and quarters. They had been 90%, and they knocked those down to zero. 
Mm. And they took the half dollar from 90% to 40%. And um, subsequently, they took all the silver out of the half dollar in 1970. So the the coins we have now are a combination of nickel and some other really base metals that you know really aren't worth anything intrinsically. And we talked about this too as the fall of the Roman Empire, you know, being mm -hmm. one of the things they did was the debasement of their coins. Yep. Uh, and I tell you folks, history repeats itself. It sure does. And uh, we're going to come back to the Roman Empire here in just a moment. Um, so there really wasn't a requirement to do the coinage act of 1965, but as usual, they picked the easiest way out. Mm -hmm. They could have raised the interest rate to increase the value of the dollar. And that would have therefore balanced out that silver that was in the coins. But then you're going to get the ensuing uh, housing market um, decrease, perhaps crash with an increase in interest rate. Same as we, we worry about today. Right. And, or they could have stopped printing dollars in excess of the gold reserves. But as usual, politicians didn't take either of the tough choices. They took the easy choice. And that was just to debase the coins. Yeah. Thank you to the 20 folks still watching uh, Will and I this morning. We got Dave Brothers on. Good morning, Dave. Spoke to you on the phone this morning. I hope you're doing well. He's coin number 1997. Alan Kelly says, take away the gold standard. Then like we know, money technically has no value. With a no limit on government spending, we begin a slow spiral down the toilet toward inflation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mark Few says, good morning, Rich. Good morning, Will. Good morning, Mark. Glad to have you on the show. So, um, the, you brought up the Romans just a moment ago, uh, Congressman Compton White of Idaho stood on the house floor as they were debating the coinage act in 1965. And he showed a chart of how, as the Roman currency debased, the empire tracked right with that. Um, so it wasn't that people were unaware of the possibilities um, now you can get on YouTube and watch it back then, but, uh, there were some, there were some leaders out there going, this is not a good idea. Uh, another one was, uh, a Congressman Walter Brown from Nevada. Um, he spoke of the treasury department's plan to sell the remaining silver to the cutlery companies. And he said, I would rather eat with chopsticks, Oof. which bear in mind the times that was still a pretty strong statement to make, you know, 20 years removed from world war two. Right. Yeah. That would that would have been the equivalent of saying something that would get you canceled today, probably. Oh, it would definitely get you canceled today. Yeah. Um, might get me canceled right now. I don't know. I'm waiting for a knock on the door. Um, so as usual, the politicians took the easy way out, just like the Romans, just like the Germans. It's it's what they do. They take the easy way out because they're thinking about the next election cycle, not the long term good of the country. That's right. All, a first term politician cares about one thing becoming a second term politician. A second term politician cares about becoming a third term politician. That's right. And the numbers just keep on changing. Um, so by, so this, this started taking the, the reins off a little bit. And by the mid sixties, we get into the guns and butter period and we're there, there's the great society programs um, brought in and also all the spending at this point, we're still ramping up into Vietnam, but there's a ton of spending going on there as well. Um, and this is just all deficit spending. Hey, napalm's um, expensive, man. Absolutely. You probably you know? ain't giving that stuff away. Yeah. You gotta buy that. That's it. And um, it, it also uh, leads us back to the military industrial complex that uh, we were warned about by a, by a leader. All right. Yeah. Um, so now we went from a dollar gap, a dollar shortage, right? Now we've got a dollar glut. And uh, history repeats itself yet again. Um, it's like we oscillate back and forth. Yeah. Yep. And it's, and, and, and just like everything else, it has to get so bad before they do anything. It's, it's bad for them. And it's the emergency for the great majority of the country, unfortunately. Um, uh, Robert is on says, good morning. Sounds like an argument for term limits. Yeah. I 100% agree with you. Couldn't agree more. The problem is the guys voting on the term limits are the guys that would be having their terms limited. That ain't going to happen. You know, Dave, brother. Yeah. Dave brother says you, have you guys read about the sale of strategic oil reserves to PRC? I have not. And if you no. can put a link up there uh, for us, Dave, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, please do. That is, uh, that is not wise. Uh, no, That's no, the no. nicest way I can think to say that right now. Yeah. Without getting the show pulled off the air. 
Exactly. Yep. So great so. society problems. We got a dollar glut. Yep. So uh, now, if you remember 1945, we used that as a baseline. A dollar's worth a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. By 1970, we're up to, it takes $2.15 to buy a dollar's worth of, of goods from 1945. So we've devalued the currency by more than 50% at this point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you're looking at uh, 30 years for 50% inflation, whatever that works out to per year. It's, uh, it's, it's insane. So, of course, wages are higher. Car prices are higher. And, of course, we look at those prices now, looking back, and, wow, oh, new Mustang for $4,000. They had it so easy, you know. Yeah, uh, my, pa my parents drove, just for context, 1972, they drove a brand-new 1972 Dodge Demon, which mm -hmm. I, a lot of people haven't heard of those. Mm -hmm. Really a badass sports car. Drove it off for under $4,000 in 1972. Yep. Open up the window, drive it off the showroom floor, for le less than four grand. Mm -hmm. So in and, and my lifetime, I mean, look at that. And that that same car now, you know, if it's in pretty good shape, is anywhere forty to fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars if you can find it. Yeah. Yep. It's it's crazy what uh you know, and as as a segue, you know, we've we've been talking about how do we preserve our our purchasing power because that's what we actually care about. We don't actually care about the dollars in our account, we care what we can purchase with them. That's right. And I've been looking at, yeah, like we talked about last time, you know, we there's investment in the stock market. There's investment in crypto. One of the things I've started looking at is collectible cars. Mm. Um, you know, now that might just be funding my 1976 Trans Am dream as well. I might be uh, rationalizing that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully my wife doesn't watch this. And, uh, you know, but it's it's a, it's another place to, to store value because cash is trash, right? And I might know a guy who's got into some nice luxury watches because mm. of the same idea yep. the value, if you will if you're into this kind of thing luxury swiss watches have gone through the roof mm -hmm. go to a rolex dealer and say you want to take a look at a stainless steel rolex the, the cases are empty because people are doing this exact same thing yep. where can i put my money uh right now and it's land it's expensive mm -hmm. cars it's expensive yep things like that, uh, that are convertible. Yep. And, uh, the was that I just heard yesterday, I want to say it was over the last five years. I may have that timeline wrong. I'll see, I'll see if I can find the link for it and I'll put it in the, the Facebook post when you, when this is up. Uh, but it's, uh, the best investment over the last five years for annual returns was contemporary art. Yeah. So it's just, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, cash is trash. So people mm -hmm. are trying to put their money in something that will last, whether that's gold or silver yep. or crypto or yep. whatever. I mean, and everybody's thinking the same thing, which is just driving the price of those, those goods through the roof. Yep. And if, if you allow me a segue for a moment here, brother, you know, this is what really annoys me about when they print money like this. It's not people with a little bit of knowledge like you or I, or the folks watching this, we everybody gets hurt for sure, but we don't get hurt near as bad because we do things to prepare for this. The people who get hurt by inflation are the poor and the say the bottom 30 40 percent of wage earners, they get crushed by this. Yeah, and our education system fails them, our politicians are not leaders, so they fail them, and it just infuriates me that, that this happens time after time and the people who get hurt are the most vulnerable in our societies. Yeah. And I think of the vulnerable, uh, when I was, uh, you know, regional manager for disaster preparedness, we had a, a winter storm that killed 31 people. And some of the people were, I remember, I don't know their names and I really don't want to know their names because it's so tragic that there was a mother and her child, froze to death in, a, in their trailer in uh, Tennessee. They had no power mm -hmm. and they didn't leave their home and they were found dead the next day, not because of carbon monoxide or anything like that. It's just, they froze to death in the, in the 21st century mm -hmm. in, in a, in a first world country. And, yeah. and you know why Will? cause they were poor. Yeah. They were poor. Yeah. So, so your point, it's absolutely well made. It's the folks watching this morning are hearing our voice, man. You are, you are on the cutting edge of preparedness. You really, really are. Mm -hmm. Hats off to you. And uh, you're taking the time and take, making the investment to be ready. But 
man, we gotta, if, if we could educate some other folks about what is going on, I think you may save them a lot of hardship. What do you think? Will? yeah, I, I think so. And that's, you know, I, I talk to people and I'm sure you do too, Rich, and, and you, you can see their eyes glaze over, you know, and, and they're more interested on what's going on with big brother or American idol or some other sort of bread and circuses, right. From the Roman yeah. empire. Right. And it, it's frustrating for me. And I, and I, I want to help people. And I, you know, yeah, I'm sure I sound like a conspiracy theory guy sometimes with this stuff. We need to talk to people who are not awake with it, but man, just a little bit of knowledge goes so far, which I'm going to go back to, to something I, I held up earlier, which is, which is, is this, mm. you know, yeah. that's a valuable coin. Now I, I can't go down and buy a case of beer with it. Okay. But the knowledge that comes from what you and Mike have put out with this and, and the other resources that are out there, and I hopefully some people are finding value in what you and I are doing here with this stuff. That knowledge is you, you said a while back, you can't take that knowledge away yep. and that knowledge can be compounded and then expressed through dollars expressed through ability to take care of your family. And that is where true value is at. That's exactly right. You know, and, and knowledge in and of itself is nothing if you don't take action. So mm -hmm. listen to what we're saying talk to your family and find out if this is the right decision for you to, to convert some of your liquidity into hard assets for something that may come down the road. And if we're wrong, I pray to God we are. Mm -hmm. But again, sure some is. of this, some of this is just pure mathematics mm -hmm. uh, that the wheels are going to come off the bus. It's not whether I want it to, of course I don't, but uh, it can. And John brings up a point here. He says, Bought my 1966 Mustang GT for $3,008 as a student at SIU. I still have it. That's incredible, John. And here's a segue for you. Uh, John, I'm also a Saluki. I went to SIU as well. So uh, I just uh, I graduated in 91. So uh, we may have run into each other down there on the strip. How cool. Yeah. And t Tony also says, what are your thoughts on Article 5 Convention in the States? I would love to see that. And for mm -hmm. those of you that aren't familiar with that, I believe that, and correct me if I'm wrong, folks that are watching out there, isn't that where like two thirds of the states mm -hmm. can bring up yes. and say, we want to propose an amendment, mm -hmm. whether our, our uh, national representatives want to or not, something like that? Mm -hmm. I believe you're correct on that. One other thing I'd like to throw out there real quick, and this is something I've had some luck with, um, with getting people to uh, start thinking this way is I'll say, let's just make up a number here. Let's say you got $10,000 in savings. And let's say you, you, you really get into this and you go, holy cow, this is scary stuff. Um, let's take $5,000 down to Costco or Sam's, whichever one you prefer, and buy the next year's worth of canned goods, tuna, veggies, go down the laundry list, and you put that in your storage room, and you eat that down over time, over the course of that year. Your savings did not change. Exactly you just right. converted it from a savings account to something that's in your house. And then if each month you take the portion of the money you would have spent at Costco or Sam's to buy those items and put it back in your savings account, at the end of the year, you'll have an empty storage room and $10,000 back in your savings account. In the meantime, if a snowstorm hits, you go, oh, well, let's play Monopoly. We got plenty of food. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Manhar is on from South Africa. Good morning, Manhar. And again, you, your shows that you and I did, brother, uh, led a lot of people to the American Warrior Society. So God bless you for that. Because once they heard you articulate the horrors that you were having mm -hmm. to face and confront, uh, it made it woke up a lot of Americans. So thank God for you, man. Uh, yeah, those those were awesome shows. What those what those folks went through over there again, mm -hmm. uh, ounce of prevention, right? Ounce of preparation. A uh, huge difference the way the way it was uh, managed by some folks over there. Yeah, and Manhar was ready, and so was a lot of people in this community. Mm -hmm. uh, Will Parker says, my walk-in vault has a little bit of precious metal in it. Yeah, precious metal could be 9 millimeter mm -hmm. ammo. You know it, 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 is that convertible? It will always be <laughs> yeah. convertible. Yeah, here, hold these for me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's so the other thing I found, too, was when, when we started doing some food storage, my grocery bill went down over the course of a year because I keep track of it because I'm a geek. Mm -hmm. Um, because then we didn't buy, we didn't go buy every week or every two weeks. We bought what was on sale every two weeks. And then we would eat our supply down a little bit. And then when tuna went on sale, we'd buy a whole bunch. We do so, the same. We do the same exact thing. We got to, yeah. 
giant it, pantry with that. Yep. Yeah. And it goes back to, this is what my grandmother who was born in 1925 taught me, you know, and, and I remember she was in her eighties and I went down to visit and we were debating whether or not to put her into a home for, um, uh, um, uh, mental, uh, memory issues. And I remember I opened up the closet in her bathroom and there were these big bricks of dial soap, you know, the multi-packs. And I said, grandma, why do you have five of these? And she said, Oh, well, they were a good buy. So that mentality stayed with her when she struggled to remember my name, she could still recognize a goodbye. And it was, it was bred into her. Yeah. And it's going to be bred into this next generation. I'm afraid. It sure is. They're going to know why great, great grandma washed tinfoil. Yeah. Uh, TC Fuller is on from, he is coin number 1620 from South Carolina. Um, Dave says, you guys should think about capturing these discussions in a book. Yeah. If someone mm -hmm. read it, I'm more than happy to. The big and, words trip me up. That's the, my problem, though. The multisyllabic <laughs> words. Multisyllabic. And Manhart says, thank you. There is so much more to share. Uh, you should watch South Africa closely. Now, Manhart, if you're up for it, mm -hmm. I want to get you back on the show. Love to see that. And Tony, uh, uh, Tony cr makes freeze-dried goods. So, Tony, please put in the link today mm -hmm. where they can find uh, your company, the Fast Group, making freeze-dried goods. Uh, incredible. Please do. I'm, I'm getting more and more interested in that. Um, also, I, uh, I see Robert put up a link to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is now at the lowest level since September of 03. Uh, probably not a good idea where oil's hovering at. I know it's been down for the last week, week and a half, but uh, uh, that along with natural gas is, has stumbled back downward in price here. Uh, but that's also because the winter is coming in a little warmer than they expected, I believe. So that'll, that'll come roaring back once we get a good cold snap here. Yes, it will. And Tony reminds us that one time wasn't spices currency. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. They were. Uh, and that's actually covered in that book. We, we alluded to earlier, the, um, the accidental superpower it goes back into why certain countries were so powerful in the spice trade. And it was geography. It wasn't political power. Uh, it was purely geography. So to get back to the show. Yeah. It is. It, I mean, okay, you talked about the dollar getting devalued. Now, is the world starting to notice this, or is just something that oh, we're yeah. seeing? Yeah. Um, you know, just because they they talk funny languages doesn't mean they're stupid. Um, so they eventually, they, they got their calculators out and started figuring out what the U.S. was spending and went, hold on, how much gold do they have? We don't believe they have that much. And it started with Charles de Gaulle. Uh, yes, that Charles de Gaulle. He was now president of France. And uh, he realized that they, we'd printed way too much money, that there was more value in gold than there, there were uh, $100 bills. And he, uh, I'm going to read this one because this is such a great quote. It says, and this is still true today, for a few cents, the United States can make a $100 bill. Everyone else must actually produce something. Gosh, that's so true. That is. And it's it's even more true today. Um so in 1965, de Gaulle announced that he was going to start trading France's um, uh, dollars for gold. And that, I'm sure, woke up a lot of the rest of the world and made them perk their eyebrows up and go, huh, why are they doing that? But you know what's funny? If you and I suggest that to people, convert some of your dollars into gold, people kind of look at you like, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, like prepper dude. Yeah, it's like no. This these are countries that realize this. They go, mm -hmm. oh, they're going to print, uh, you know, another three trillion. Okay, mm -hmm. we need to dump some of this crap. Yep, absolutely. It becomes a race to the bottom because then, when we print all this money, it devalues the dollar. That makes us look better in international trade. So then, other countries, or in the case of the euro zone, they print more of their currency, and it's just a a, a race down the toilet. It is. That's a great way to say it. So. Um, so what happened when, um, uh, de Gaulle said he wanted his gold back, he didn't say, Hey, you know, just, just send it over when you get a chance. U S mail. He sent French Navy warships over and said, you can just load them right on there. Yeah. And, and of course, if that was pointing. exactly. And, uh, if, if that happened today, they'd have to wait, you know, uh, four weeks off the coast for a spot in a, in a port, uh, if that happened today. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine something like that happening today? The twenty yeah, with a twenty four hour happen. news cycle. Holy cow! Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah craziness. Um, so at that point, 
uh, gold on the spot market. Now, at this point, Americans still weren't allowed to own gold. Uh, however, the uh, uh, jewelers were obviously purchasing gold. And also in foreign markets, uh, individuals could own gold. And gold jumped up to $40 an ounce. I thought it was pegged at 35. What happened? Well, it was, but as, as always, economics trumps policy. That's right. Or I should say the real world trumps policy. Um, so in the forties, the United States had held two thirds of the world's gold. And the best estimate we have is by 1971, um, uh, they had 16%. We had 16%. So listen to what he's saying. In 1940s, we had two thirds of all the gold in the world. Now, here we are in 1971, we got what, 16%? Is that what you said? 16, yep. Wow. Yeah. And, and we're just printing dollars like crazy. Yeah. So we've got less gold and more dollars. So they're they're burning off both ends of that candle. And remember and that, what remember from last show, folks, we talked about there was a there was something in place at the time that said the the uh the dollars you print must be backed by at least 40% of gold. Well, now we're we're off that standard, mm -hmm. so we can print uh yep. whatever we want, and now we've got 16% left. Yeah. Hey, and, and TC brings up a point. I said warships. I apologize. It was ships. I apologize. So, um, and like he said, where do they find those at? So, yep. I apologize. I misspoke there. So, um, so I like your version of history better though. Be yeah, it was, more entertaining, but I, I apologize. I misspoke. So like we just talked about they're depleting the gold reserves and they're printing more money. So it's a double whammy there. So 1971 hits. This is a no good rotten year for the United States of America. Um, Switzerland redeemed 50 million US dollars for gold. And this was when France redeemed an additional 191 million dollars. And same way you used to get runs on the bank when when you talked about um, the period of time when, when we talked about the period of time leading up to the Federal Reserve, you get runs on banks. Mm -hmm. That's what was feared. We were feared we were going to get a run on the U.S. gold reserves, a, a run on the U, the, the U.S. bank, if you will. Um, well, people so, have said for years, what's in the what's in the vault at uh, you know Fort Knox? Is there anything even in it? When's the last time anybody went in there? Uh, not who knows. They won't yeah. tell us, right? They still nope. won't tell us. Even now that we're off the gold standard, they still won't tell us. Uh, I, I, my my own personal theory on that is, they fear somebody can go back and do the math and figure out just when the charade really ended. Yeah. Um, so there's, they're scared that there's going to be a run on the gold reserves. Um, August 5th, 1971, Congress releases a report saying that we should stay on the gold reserve. However, they want to reprice gold at $50 an ounce. 50 bucks an ounce. So not 35. Mm -hmm. Jewelers are saying it's worth at least 40. 40. Congress yep. says we need to go to 50. Okay. Yep. So it would be officially an additional, what would that be? 40% devaluation of the dollar officially at that mm -hmm. point. And that's so, because, once again, I want to remind everybody, that's because gold has gotten better, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's pure now. It went from 100% pure to 100% pure. So that's way more valuable. But in reality, folks, just because your dollar's worth a whole lot less. That's it. That's and the it. golds, and let's find out what the current gold spot price is as of this moment of us sitting here. Okay. Let's see. It is, this is the ask, $1,865.03. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what gold is worth now. Will saying Congress is looking at it and going, wow, we devalued our dollar so much. We need to raise the price of gold to $50 an ounce. I'm telling you, as we're sitting here right now, it's worth almost $1,900 an ounce. Yeah. And guess what? As things continue to go in the direction that they're going and keep printing more money, what do you think the price of gold is going to be a year from now, two years, mm -hmm. four years from now? Mm -hmm. and long term, it only goes one direction, brother. That's right. You know, yeah, there's ups and downs, there's back and forth, but long term, look at a long term gold chart compared to a long term dollar chart. Yep, it's a big X. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that that actually segues into the uh, Bitcoin show we will do once we get uh, get through with this series here. Um, and I'll just throw a little uh, teaser out there for that. People like to think gold is finite. It is not because there are gold miners. So mm -hmm. it's limited in how much it can grow in, in supply each year, but it's not finite. 
No, it's not finite, but as of uh, the last report I read, it cost gold miners like $1,100 or $1,200 an ounce to pull that gold mm -hmm. ore out of the ground. So yep. there is a cost amount. It's not like really, so to say that is to say gold cannot fall below $1,100 an ounce because it will not be worth to extract it. Right. Because there, yep. there's a fixed cost on those miners to pull that stuff out of the ground. Yep. Agreed. Um, so uh, to review real quick, August 5th, Congress comes out and says, need to stay on the gold standard, but reprice it to 50. August 15th of 1971, Nixon goes on television and without advisor consent from Congress or any bread and wood nations, any of those 44 nations, he closes the gold window, changes the whole deal on his own. But that's just for now, right? I mean, he didn't. Temporary. <laughs> and here we are 50 years later. It's uh -huh. still temporary. Yeah, temporary. A uh, big word that, that was that I, I read. There's nothing that lasts longer than a temporary government program. Yeah. I'm uh, just, a, this is such an uh, interesting thing. Temporary. If you go to a lot of military bases now, you'll see like, this isn't building number 401 or whatever it says, uh, TC 401 or TB 401. And what that means is temporary building or temporary campsite and it, it's something that was built in 1940 by the civilian conservation corps mm -hmm. and we're still using it and we still call it yep. a temporary structure yep yeah it's crazy and tc brings up a good point here uh it's really stunning just how arbitrary our entire financial system is it's like a very large poorly understood collective delusion that's exactly what it is it's a tinkerbell effect man Look it into is. it it yeah. is it's, stop calling me names man stop calling me names. <laughs> um um so temporarily the U S dollar can no longer be converted to gold. And, you know, it, it's easy to be real critical of Nixon, but he was he, at this point, he was backed into a corner. He had two really bad choices. And if he allowed there for to be a, a run on our, our gold reserves, it was going to get really ugly, really fast. So, you know, we're, I'm critical of Nixon too, for doing this and not showing better leadership and raising interest rates and making the dollar stronger. But, He's going to take, he's a politician. He's going to take the politician's choice that they're predictable. I would love to read what, what conversations went on before he said, I'm holding a press conference, get the media in here. Like what, what, he, can, you know, what metaphorical gun was held mm -hmm. to his head to make that decision? I, I you know, I'm, that's a good question. I'm gonna start doing some research on that. If I find a good book on that, I'll, I'll put it up on the, the coin Please. members page. The, Please. uh, I, he did consult. Uh, prior to that at, at Camp David with the secretary of the treasury and some other appointed officials uh, who were his confidants, but he did not consult with Congress or the bread and woods countries. So it was in that sense, an arbitrary decision. Uh, yeah. And along, <clears throat> go ahead. I'm sorry. Will. Uh, okay. Uh, I was going to say along with that, he also ex uh, used executive order one, one, six, one, five. And I absolutely detest executive orders myself. Um uh, we're not a dictatorship that changes every four or eight years. That's not the way the founding fathers set up the system. Um, but that executive order put a 90 day freeze on wages and prices to ensure there wasn't inflation coming right out of this, because this was us basically saying we've defaulted on the dollar. Yep. So he put a 90 day freeze on things to, you know, try and calm things down a little bit. He also put a 10% surcharge on all goods coming into the U S uh, so that you, uh, the American made products would remain competitive. And I'm sure, I, I don't know if that 10% surcharge, I'm sure it went away at some point. Um, but executive orders just aren't the way things are supposed to be done. I t completely agree with you. You know, executive orders used to be like, I'm going to name this park after Susan B. Anthony. I'm going to issue executive order 101 to uh, say that this turkey gets a pardon. I mean, that's right. the kind of stuff. Now it's like your party gets in power and there's a stack of executive orders to just mm -hmm. completely dismantle the last presidency. And yep. that's not at all what our country should be. And now it just goes back and forth, back and forth. And yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's dog and pony show at this point. Um, so now rich, I'm, I'm guessing you understand that when Nixon went on TV and did this, he went, you know what, for years, your, your politicians, your leaders have been irresponsible and that's why we're in this situation. Right. I'm guessing not. You, no, you are so cynical. I know. You are so cynical. Well, yeah. you're right. He went on TV and blamed, quote, the international money speculators. 
Uh, you mean the people who realize that the Americans are printing too many dollars and now they want the gold while well, they're getting still good? Those evil speculators. That's right. You mean people who own calculators is what you mean. <laughs> that's right. People who so, own calculators. Right. So they they that's who we blamed it on. And uh, that's why for, for years, and I think even now there's, you know, you hear about somebody, oh, shorting stocks is bad. Well, shorting stocks is what helps us find actual price discovery. Because mm -hmm. if it gets run up too much, somebody's going to short it. I, you know, I've told this probably before, but my my grandfather, Ralph Brown, he had, uh, I don't know, third grade education, couldn't read and write, but he, uh, you know, amassed quite a bit of wealth for uh, illiterate East Tennessee. And I mean, he was worth over a million dollars when he passed mm -hmm. away because he was really good at math. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't you don't need to read and write, I guess, if you understand mathematics. And one of the things he always said was you have to allow the price of goods to float when the government mm -hmm. starts messing with the price of goods and services. They make a mess of it. I mean, he was yep. dead set on that to the day he died. At yep. Even. Price discovery is the secret of capitalism. It is. It truly is. There's a there's a great story about that. Um, we're running kind of long on time here, so I'll keep it really short. It was back during the Depression or shortly thereafter. J.P. Morgan of J.P. Morgan Bank and Tiffany of Tiffany Jewelers were friends in New York City. And J.P. Morgan had a thing for tie tax, tie pins. And he really liked that uh, certain color. I think it was a green, like an emerald type color. And Tiffany came across one and he sent it over to JP Morgan's office with a note said with a messenger back in that day. So the price is $5,000 and that's a lot of money back then. Right. Yeah. And so Morgan sent back a note and said, how about 4,000 and more and Tiffany sent the messenger back said, no, the price is 5,000. And the messenger comes back with the blue Tiffany box and Tiffany opens it up expecting to see the, the tie tax still in there at this point, but there's a check for $5,000 and said so JP Morgan sent a note back saying, just checking the price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything's yeah. in negotiation. Everything's in negotiation. Yep. So, but so we, we have to have that price discovery and I'll tell you one thing your grandfather did have though. He may have had a third grade, third grade ed education, and be illiterate, but he had a black belt in common sense. Yes, he did. That's a fact. Common sense and a little math will get you a long ways. Yeah, you know, he owned land, he owned cattle, they grew their own food. Uh, and I think that's why they stayed so healthy. You know, they they mm -hmm. ate off their own land, they ate their own cattle, yeah. it wasn't processed, and I don't know. Yeah. So uh so just one last little bit here, and then uh we'll get get going here. Uh, the immediate aftermath of this by uh, 1973, two years on, uh, other countries started letting their currencies float and have a variable exchange rate. And that's where we still are today. And it's where you see people trading currencies. Um, and in 1976, this temporary government program became permanent when they removed, uh, in all the statutes and laws, they removed all reference of gold in all the statutes uh, referring to the dollar. And it's funny, everybody that uh, there's a lot of people out there. Ah, gold, that's really quaint. I would never do. That. I think Warren Buffett is that way. He, mm -hmm. he doesn't own gold. He says it doesn't earn anything. Yeah, well, there's no dividend. But I find that odd because there isn't a single Warren Buffett stock that pays a dividend. There isn't exactly. a single Berkshire or Hathaway company that pays a dividend. But he doesn't like gold because it doesn't pay a dividend. And he only invests in stocks that pays dividends or mm -hmm. something like that. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, pot, anyway. kettle, kettle, meat pot. Exactly. All right. Well, anything else for today? No, sir. That's it. All right. Uh, Tony, uh, Tony says, do executive orders actually hold any legal merit? Well, it certainly would appear that way, sir. I don't know if statu statutorily they do. Yeah, I, I don't know. I know everyone that was uh, put out by the previous administration, there was a lawsuit on. And seems like these are just kind of skating through right now. Yeah, they are. Mark Few says, thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Alan says, sorry, got to go. Trip to the vet with a pup. Catch the remainder of the show later. Uh, thank you, folks, for being on with mm -hmm. Will and I on another Please, Friday morning edition of Coffee with Rich and Will. Anything else, Will, or you want to no, close this out? No, sir, that's it. Have a great weekend, and I see we're taking next week also. Have a happy Thanksgiving to you and the family. You too, Will. And uh, next Friday, I think we have Scott Jedlinski on, so that should be an interesting show. He's the red dot master right now so he's gonna give us a lot of really good stuff looking forward to that one i'm looking forward to get, uh, finding a class i can get into with him as well yeah you and me both brother so will take us out all right folks the fight's coming be ready <laughs>